Andra mojennepe musa polutropun hos malapolla plankta e peitrujas hirump tulietrune perse. Polon dantropon viden vastea kai nun egna. Polla togen punta i paten algea on katatymun. Arnymenos hän tepsyk hän, kai nostun he tähän. Hello everyone, my name is Freud and today we are going to talk about the Iliad, arguably one of the most famous epics in Western civilization. For the origin of the Iliad, I have to take you back to ancient Greece. But Greece is not a name the people living in Greece in 1000 BC gave themselves. The word Greece derived from the later Latin word Greeky. Greeks like Achilles or Agamemnon refer to themselves as Hellens or Achaeans living in Hellas. It's unclear why the Romans changed the name so drastically. However, it should be noted that Hellas does not form one single nation. Hellas forms no unity, neither territorial nor political. There are, however, some common features or some common elements that uh, create a sense of solidarity. For example, the common tongue, which is very important. Also, the religion is uh, the same. Homer is traditionally regarded as the author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, another very famous epic. The central theme in both the stories is a Trojan War. Troy, or Ilion as Homer called the city, hence the name of his epic, the Iliad, was a major city in the Hittite Empire in modern-day Turkey. The ancient Greeks believed that the Trojan War was an historical event that took place around the 13th or 12th century BC. Whether there is truly any reality behind the Trojan War remains an open question. The Iliad is an example of epic poetry. Originally, it is poetry that was recited and listened to by an audience of mostly illiterate people. But when we read the works of Homer, we have to deal with petrified poetry that can no longer do justice to the oral tradition out of which it stems. I mean, we don't understand Asian Greek and we don't have a bard who can sing us a song. Take a look at the famous opening of the epic. The traces of oral tradition are found here. In the first lines, the words are laid in the mouths of bards or idos, who addresses the muses. Then the bards or idos uh, continues to recite the story from his memory. Of course, this is, a, this is a very tiring effort, so there are certain tools called formulaic expressions that the bard can use when he needs some rest. These formulaic expressions are phrases or passages that can be inserted in a story at any time. Epitheton ornans literally means by name for decoration. Names and objects in the Iliad are often accompanied with an adjective. For example, Hector is often accompanied with the, with the phrase tamer of horses, Hector the tamer of horses, and Achilles as Achilles the swift-footed or the lion-hearted. Reasons why this might be the case is that Greeks loved beautiful adjectives. Another reason might be that Homer had to find fitting words to fill up open spaces in his stanzas. Because the Iliad is written in a dictalic hexameter, every line has to follow a certain rhyme scheme, so sometimes the poet has to search for the right word to fit the scheme. There are also a lot of repetitions in the Iliad. Calculations show us that one third of the Iliad consists out of material that appears more than once in the story. So what is the Iliad about? The story starts in Medias Res. Meaning that it doesn't begin in the beginning of the story, but in the middle of action. Now the epic is divided in 24 books, but for convenience sake I'll, I shall summarize it as if it were just one book. So it starts when the Siege of Troy is already 10 years on the go, but through flashbacks we get to know all the things that happened before the war and during the first 10 years of the war. The Iliad recounts a brief but crucial period of the Trojan War, a conflict between the city of Troy and its allies against the confederation of Greek cities, collectively known as the Achaeans. The conflict began when Paris, the son of Troy's king Priam, seized a willing Helen, the most beautiful woman in the world, from the Achaean king Menelaus. The Achaeans raised a massive army and sailed to Troy, bent on win winning Helen back by force. As the story begins, the war is in its ninth year. The Achaeans have recently sacked a nearby city, taking several beautiful women captive, along with a lot of treasure. Chryses, a priest of Apollo from the sacked city, approaches the Achaean camp and asks the plague ravages through the Achaean army, and desperate for an answer, the Achaeans ask the prophet Calchas about the plague's cause. 
Calchas instructs Agamemnon to give back Briseis's daughter. Agamemnon agrees reluctantly, but demands that he would be given Briseis, the captive girl given to the warrior Achilles, as compensation. Achilles is enraged by Agamemnon's demand and refuses to fight any longer for Agamemnon. Achilles, the greatest of the Achaean fighters, desires revenge on Agamemnon. He calls to his mother, Thetis, an immortal sea nymph, and asks her to beseech Zeus to, to turn the tide of the war against the Achaeans. Since Achilles is fated to die a glorious death in battle, an Achaean collapse will help him give Achilles glory, allowing him to come to their aid. On the battlefield, Paris and Menelaus agree to duel to end the war. Menelaus is victorious, but the Trojans break the agreement. The armies plunge into a battle that lasts several days. In the fighting, many soldiers distinguish themselves, including Priam's son, Hector. The tide of battle turns several times, but the Trojan forces under Hector eventually push the Achaeans back to the fortification they have built around their ships. Meanwhile, a conflict is being waged between the gods. Athena, Hera and Poseidon support the Achaean forces, while Apollo, Aphrodite and Ares support the Trojans. As the battle rages on, the gods give strength and inspiration to their respective champions. Eventually, Zeus bans intervention in the war by the other gods. Under immense pressure, the elderly Achaean captain Nestor proposes that an embassy be sent to Achilles in order to convince him to return to battle. Achilles listens to their pleas but ultimately refuses, stating that he will not stir until the Trojans attack his own ships. After a prolonged struggle, the Trojans finally break through the Achaean forces, threatening to burn the ships and slaughter the Achaeans. Achilles' inseparable comrade, Patroclus, fearing the, fearing the destruction of the Achaean forces, asks Achilles if he can take his place in battle. Achilles eventually agrees, and as the first Achaean ships begin to burn, Patroclus leads out Achilles' army, dressed in Achilles' armor in order to frighten the Trojans. Patroclus fights excellently, and the Trojans are repulsed from the ships. However, Patroclus disobeys Achilles' order to return after driving back the Trojans. He pursues the Trojans all the way to the gates of Troy. Zeus, planning this sequence of events all along, allows Apollo to knock Patroclus over. Hector then kills Patroclus as he lies on the ground, and a battle breaks out over Patroclus' body. Hector strips Achilles' armor from Patroclus, but Menelaus and others manage to save the body. When Achilles learns of Patroclus' death, he is stricken with grief, desiring revenge on Hector and the Trojans. Achilles reconciles with Agamemnon. His mother Thetis visits the smith god Hephaestus, who forges new, superhuman armor for Achilles, along with a magnificent shield that depicts the entire world. Meanwhile, the Trojans camp outside their city walls, underestimating Achilles' fury. The next day, Achilles dons his armor and launches into battle, slaughtering numerous Trojans on the, place of Troy, on the plains of Troy. The Trojans flee from the rage of Achilles and hide inside the walls of Troy. Hector alone remains outside the wall, determined to stand fast against Achilles, but as Achilles approaches him, Hector loses his nerve and begins to run. Achilles chases Hector around the walls of Troy four times, but eventually Hector turns and faces Achilles. With the help of Athena, Achilles kills Hector. He, at he attaches Hector's corpse to his chariot and drags the body back to the Achaean camps as revenge for Patroclus' death. Achilles holds an elaborate funeral for Patroclus, which is followed by a series of athletic games. After the games, Achilles continues to drag Hector's body around Patroclus' corpse for nine days. The gods, wishing to see Hector buried properly, sent Priam, escorted by Hermes, to ransom Hector's body. Priam pleads with Achilles for mercy, asking Achilles to remember his own aging father. Achilles is moved by Priam's entreaty and agrees to give back Hector's body. Priam returns to Troy with Hector and the, Trojan, and the Trojans grieve for their loss. A truce is declared while the, while the Trojans bury Hector. It is certain that Homer had a huge share in the creation of the Iliad, but the exact role that the figure Homer played is still subject of debate. Was he really the blind singer from the island of Kion, as tradition has it? Do we really have to create him for all the epics? We don't know. We are not even sure if he wrote the epics. Even his mere existence is questioned by some schoolers. Maybe multiple people hid behind the name Homer? All we know is that throughout history, and still today, Homer is seen as a father of Western literature. The rest remains, and will probably always remain, shrouded in mystery. That is it for this video, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, have a nice day.